Hello and welcome to this very timely panel um, on reflation and inflation. I'm pleased to bring in our panelists uh, to discuss how we are positioning for reflation or inflation. We have Double Line Capital's Robert Cohen, Director of Developed Credit. We are also joined by Double Line Capital's Jeff Sherman, Deputy Chief Investment Officer. Um, it's great to have you both here for this investor day and it seems that inflation has just been the big topic of late it's been quite a hot topic so for the both of you um how would you characterize uh the current inflation outlook it seems within this debate we have people saying you know this is going to be transitory and others who are saying that this could be rampant inflation so uh let's start there and uh, start with your outlooks robert do you want to go first yeah sure so I'm of the opinion that uh, we're in for longer lasting inflation. I think there are a couple of things that I would point out. Uh, people always look after uh, the great financial crisis at the Fed QE and use that as a reason to say, well, if QE didn't work before, why is it going to work now? Uh, we're in a different environment now. We have uh, a monetary uh, a stimulus, but we also have, or excuse me, fiscal stimulus, we also have monetary as well. So with uh, so those twin guns going, uh, we have a translation mechanism where there's money going in people's pockets directly, where the monetary policy was putting liquidity in the banking system. Uh, the fiscal stimulus that we're embarking on now is actually putting people in money's pocket, people, uh, money in people's pocket. So they actually have dollars to spend in a way that they didn't have, uh, you know, with just just the monetary policy that happened uh, uh, after the great financial crisis. Uh, another thing that I think is important to identify is that we're in a different thinking in terms of how the uh, economy operates. Globalization has been a, a hot topic for decades. We've learned through this recent pandemic the kind of downside of globalization. You have supply chain disruptions. You have key uh, industries that are at risk when you're rolling out other countries for supply, such as semiconductors, healthcare, and so on. And we're in an environment where now uh, the trend is to onshore those types of uh, uh, manufacturing capacities. If you think about uh, semiconductors as, a, as an example, uh, taking that onshore is inflationary. It's a lot more expensive to manufacture semiconductors in the U.S. versus uh, Asia. The cost can be up to a third more. That's inflationary. Then you can go through other supply chains. This uh, process of bringing onshore uh, is going to raise costs, and that's going to flow through into the into the economy. Uh, you can just also just say that the Fed wants higher inflation, and they have a very strong force in the economy. And if they're looking to run the economy above average inflation, above trend, then it's possible that they can engineer that, and so uh, that's a pretty powerful force. Those are a couple of things. You can get into demographics, you can get into other supply chain shortages. Uh, I think that there's plenty to talk about that uh, indicates that there's potential for inflation. Um, so maybe I'll pause and, and let, uh, let uh, Jeff Sherman hop in there as well. No, I think uh, Robert hit all the salient points there. But additionally, I think we need to really digest what we saw in today's report. And we all knew about base effects. We've, you know, anybody who trades the markets knows that we were going to have significant year-over-year -year prints, but what was really surprising today was looking at the month over month print and looking at core inflation coming in at 90 basis points month over month. I mean, this is a number we haven't seen on a monthly basis since 1982. And that's very, very different than saying we have this increase in year over year just simply due to base effects. We saw one of the largest month over month increases that we've seen. So when we think about inflation to dismiss it as transitory, I don't think anybody got that, that report right today of this newfound month over month inflation. Now, Robert mentioned supply disruptions. Uh, he's also talked about you know, the supply chains, the, the nationalization versus globalization, and all those things lead to higher cost. And you've seen this through PPI data. But if we dig through, which is the producer price index, but if you dig through the CPI prints and you look at it in two broad categories, look at its goods and look at its services, it was undeniable that service inflation last year was going to be on a downward trajectory, albeit on a positive manner, it decelerated from the levels that we've seen uh, really in the post-financial crisis era where services were around 3% per annum. 
plus or minus call it 50 basis points. They dipped below two last year. In fact, they got as low as like 1.5%. So what we saw though was the handoff from services to goods. That's what maintained the level of inflation. And we saw this in durable goods. And I know uh, my fellow colleagues have talked about this a lot today. But what we saw on the good side is that goods had been disinflationary or deflationary really since the 2003 experience. And so that five plus years until we saw the tariffs come in, goods was actually a drag on CPI. So if there's any level of maintaining the goods consumption while we resume the economy here in the US, what you're gonna see is that you're going to have inflation that's gonna persistently print in this level above 3%. And so to dismiss this as transitory, I think it's very, it's doing yourself a disservice. I think, but also to say that this is going to be a persistent is also, you know, trying to be too myopic and extrapolating the current experience. So what we think that what one should do is watch the data set, continue to look at components and see what's driving it. A lot of the print today came from things like increase in airline prices, car automobiles. So things that potentially can't continue to grow at those significant rates. But if they did, uh, can you imagine buying a 169 10-year, uh, knowing that you're gonna get four handle type of inflation? And so from my perspective, I, I'm in the, I think, inf I, I agree with uh, Mr. Cohen here, that I think inflation will continue to be at a more elevated level than we're used to seeing uh, uh, post-financial crisis, but I'm not convinced yet that it's something rampant or out of control. But the Fed dismissing it as transitory, you saw uh, Clarita come out and say that this morning, um, with, without even really just thinking through the data, just shows me that it's more important for the Fed to manage the narrative because they don't want to lose control of the bond market. Um, so if inflation is going to be uh, persistent, let's talk about how to position one's portfolio to take advantage of it. Um, so Jeff um, Sherman, let's we'll start with you here. Um, within the context of a portfolio, how are you thinking about, um, you know, inflation hedges and expressing uh, those hedges? Right. So what I what I, I think about it in different asset classes, and I get this question all the time, especially you know in the last few months. What do I do with my fixed income portfolio uh, to to think about inflation hedges or to benefit or protect my portfolio against inflation? And one thing that the natural extension is people start talking about the tips market, the Treasury inflation protected securities, and these securities are are quite nice in an inflationary environment, but what they price. They already have an expectation of inflation there it, it built into them. If you look at the five year break even spread today, which you can infer from the market, it says that inflation is going to run around 2.6% per annum for the next five years. So if you think about that, the bond market is already pricing inflation above uh, what the Fed kind of talks about their targets being. So um, what I believe in the tips market that it doesn't offer great value today. And the reason I don't think so is that there's been a new player in town in the tips market starting last year. Prior to the pandemic, the Federal Reserve owned about, on their balance sheets of their QE primes, owned approximately 7% of the tips market. Today, that number is 22% of the outstanding. So you have a, a non-discriminate buyer in that market, somewhat distorted prices, and then a lot of people have piled into these trades, you know, thinking inflation is coming. So. I think that uh, that the tips market isn't cheap, so it's not the best inflation hedge. Now, if we're going to a four or five percent inflation, yes, the tips market would be significantly better than owning nominals. So, what's a bond investor to do? Well, one thing you could do is just shorten the duration of your portfolio. Now, why would I why would I hypothesize that? Well, if you think about inflation, that we need to generate some sort of positive real yields. That means that if we're getting more and more inflation, yields should be on the rise. So you can think about that from a perspective, not wanting to own as much duration in your portfolio. And Julia, uh, in our conversations earlier, we discussed, well, think about what happened in the first quarter. Yields were higher in the first quarter on the 10 year and the 30 year treasury than they are today. So you have still a chance to think about resculpting the portfolio when it comes to positioning the duration of the overall uh, strategy. Now, another thing you can do is just focus on what would happen in this inflationary environment? If the Fed continue with their narrative, that means the curve steepens. So if you think about something outside of your fixed income portfolio, and again, I'll let Robert talk about how to express credit to take advantage of this, but if you wanna move over 
to thinking about parts of the equity market that could benefit from a curve steepener. That's things such as the financials, healthcare, and value sectors of the market. Where that again, remember the Fed's objective is to maintain sanity and, and, and the functionality within the banking system. So a steeper curve isn't antithetical to the Fed's objectives either. Another thing and something that we've been advocating for many months is also going outside of these two traditional markets and looking at the commodities market. Uh, as we've seen here, just listen to Robert's thesis as he started off about the supply constraints. What we have is a global economy that's not firing together today. And look at where commodity prices are. Can you imagine with the supply constraints and the underinvestment within the commodity space and the lack of capital expenditures that have transpired in that space that what you see if we had an increased global demand today? Think about the reopening of Europe. Think about what you learned from the emerging market panels. And if these economies step back into the consumption side of the equation, given the supply constraints in, in industrial metals, in the energy complex, the foods, that says commodities have a lot of room to run. And I like to always remind people the cure for high prices is high prices. So even though certain pockets of the commodity market have been on an absolute tear for the last nine months, uh, I remind people that remember commodities are fixed limited supply. And if you can't deliver that supply, the, dy dy the demand dynamic will drive prices higher. So there are other ways to really position portfolios. You just don't have to go to tips. And I'll let Robert talk about ways that he thinks about credit and things that we're doing in our, our fixed income portfolios on an active basis today. Robert? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So when you invest in fixed income, obviously you need to take either investment uh, interest rate risk or credit risk. And after the backdrop we just laid out, uh, interest rate risk has plenty of dangers. When I think about credit risk, I start thinking about what do earnings look like? That's the foundation, the, the, the base that you start with when you talk about investing in things that have credit risk. And we have, as you would expect coming out of a recession, uh, a real renaissance in earnings. And so while companies are generating positive revenue and earnings and cash flow growth, you have a very strong backdrop to take credit risk. And so in the corporate space, you basically have three general categories of credit risk you can take. There's the investment grade. So those are the highest credit quality companies that are rated uh, AAA to B. You have high yield and then you have bank loans. Now, the issue with investment grade is it has very long duration. So you have a very strong company that's seeing very uh, uh, significant earnings growth as you're coming out of a recession, as you're seeing all this stimulus from both the, from the Fed and from Congress. So that is, uh, is a great support for earnings, but you take all of this interest rate risk because duration is so long. And so the, uh, uh, the amount of spread you get for that duration makes investment grade credit look less attractive than other places because of that rate concern, particularly if we're gonna see inflation and rising rates. High yield sits somewhere in between. High yield has much shorter duration. Uh, it has much higher yield, although now around 4%, it's hard to call it high yield. Uh, you can maybe call it higher yield. That might be a way to describe it. Earnings have been unbelievably strong in high yield. They've had uh, a 30% growth in earnings, uh, and the outlook is for some order of magnitude, something similar to that, 30 plus percent growth in earnings. And so that's a tremendous uh, uh, tailwind for credit. Uh, but then again, you have uh, interest rate risk. And so we, we gravitate towards uh, bank loans and CLOs, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, because they have the lowest duration. And if you look at what's been working in credit uh, year to date, it perfectly aligns in duration where investment grade has the highest duration. It's had uh, the worst return, uh, almost negative 4%. High yield has a lower sort of intermediate level duration, and that's been up a little over 2%. And the winner has been bank loans simply because it just doesn't have that duration. And so investing in uh, bank loans, which are floating rate, uh, give you the protection if you're going to see uh, rising rates. Uh, we also like loans because they are secured by the company's assets. So if you're, again, worried about uh, you know, the direction of, of the economy and you're looking at relative uh, returns, if you can get the same return in, high, in bank loans that are secured by assets versus high yield that is unsecured, uh, we favor the, the safer thing. So if you can get more safety for the same return, then uh, that uh, lends itself to the bank loan market. Uh, it's important to say though that all these markets, uh, are the three that I mentioned, uh, investment grade, high yield, and loans, are broadly diversified markets and you can pick 
the part of the market that you want to be in. It is not a thematic bet on one sector like energy or air, aerospace or something or so on. And so you can tilt the portfolio into areas that you think will do well. So what are those? Uh, in an environment where you have inflation and maybe cost pressures, uh, technology has the highest margins and the hardest to rip out. I mean, the most extreme example that I use is imagine trying to get rid of Microsoft. I mean, we're talking about Microsoft products. If you want to rip it out uh, in your personal or in your professional life, it'd be extremely difficult. Microsoft knows that, and uh, that's why they can not constantly raise prices. So there's areas of technology, particularly in software like Microsoft, where it's mission critical, it's hard to rip out, you can charge high margins, and it doesn't matter if there's inflation, people are still going to consume those products. So we like that a lot. Healthcare would be another sector. Uh, healthcare has a lot of inflation already, uh, and so uh, inflation in healthcare is probably going to continue. And so that's an area that has higher margin. It has the ability to absorb not just rate rises, but you know, we can talk about taxes. Taxes are going to uh, likely go up uh, with uh, the Biden plan that they're uh, uh, passing around now as a potential uh, uh, infrastructure plan along with higher taxes. Well, companies need to absorb that. So you have to have higher ma margins. You have to be able to absorb those costs and potentially pass them on to onto your customers. So tech and healthcare have those. There are sectors that don't have those attributes that we worry about. I think the highest level screen we use is what if something wasn't working pre-pandemic, it's probably not going to work post-pandemic. So uh, theaters. Uh, the theaters are a part of the high yield and bank loan market. Uh, they were struggling before uh, we had a pandemic because uh, you know movies are kind of not very good quality. People don't want to go to a movie theater as much. Everything's available online with streaming. That was a, a, a sector that was weak before before COVID. Uh, now. Imagine going to a theater. It seems uh, rather hard to imagine. And maybe once the pandemic lifts, maybe people will be a little bit more comfortable. But that's a se that's a sector that's in secular decline. And I think those are areas you want to avoid. Uh, retail. I mean, retail was was challenged before COVID. Uh, Amazon was eating up uh, uh, retailers before we had a pandemic. Now they've just been decimated. So <clears throat> trying to bet on a retail strategy now is really uh, fraught with risk. And so the broader point is, it's not just an asset class. I think active management is very important. You want to be in the sectors that will do well in not just a rising rate environment, but a changing economic landscape where people's behaviors are changing. You certainly have a technology uh, displacement in many sectors. And you have to think about how do you make the portfolio work considering all of these factors. So that's why we like bank loans. Uh, I think the last thing I mentioned is CLOs. CLOs are really a, a, just a, a levered play on bank loans. You take a bank loan portfolio and you add leverage to it, and that allows you to pick your uh, risk profile. You can go to the higher quality parts of uh, the CLO market and get uh, a little bit more protection and a little bit less yield, or you can go lower into the mezz and equity parts of CLOs and pick up some yield relative to the bank loan market. But you know the simple uh, thesis is if you're not if you have an asset class in bank loans and, and CLOs that uh, don't really have basically zero duration and you have the backdrop of growing earnings uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty stable and strong environment for a carry trade and for getting this kind of income so that's why we like those sectors mm -hmm. yeah and, and you you mentioned the point of you know active management um across this asset class, you know, not just looking at as an asset class, but really being active about where you want to be. Um, you know, Jeff Sherman, for the areas that you're in, um, how do you think about, you know, where exactly you want to be in some of the spaces maybe you want to avoid? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I think the tips market's a bit rich at this point. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Cohen on, on the idea of investigating corporate bonds. And you have a very supportive backdrop, but just look at what happened to the investor grade corporate market when rates rose uh, in the first quarter of this year. So uh, just because you have supportive fundamentals, uh, you have to remember how those securities are executed and the other part of the characteristics there. So what we've been really focused on is paring down some of our duration risk. Uh, at our last asset allocation meeting, that was something we decided to do. Um, we've also seen parts of the market get crowded. I, I mentioned the tips market being crowded, but the agency mortgage market is getting a bit crowded as well. 
Uh, there's been massive bank demand when when they change the SLR ratios. Uh, you saw a lot of uh, people step into that space. Um, the mortgage basis is extremely tight. Uh, people think that we love mortgages all the time. In fact, we're we're more negative on mortgages on the agency side than we have been, especially specific coupons, uh, just because of the profile and that bank bid for those assets. So there, there's ideas that fundamentals um, drive things, but you also have to remember there's a price you pay. So um, e even though there's the, some of these crowding in some of these markets, the beta trades, um, I do think that the alpha in credit is critical at this point in time. So the way we've been thinking about multi-sector portfolios is to own a little bit of duration just in case you're wrong and do it what I call in the purest manner. Own some treasuries, own some agency mortgages, um, but do so so that you can benefit if you're wrong, if we have rollover risk, uh, the risk my colleagues have identified all day uh, to the overall economy. However, when you take your credit exposure, why also take duration? You're doubling down on the same risk. So let's use pockets of the securitized market. I know that's been a theme of ours today because that part of the market is primed for a rising rate environment. Shorter duration assets, they also amortize so you get cash flows back, you can reinvest at higher yields. The secret to managing a bond portfolio is reinvestment of cash flows and that's missed on a lot of people out there. Um, when it comes to things like the commodity sector, I think you should own broad baskets. This is not a gold market, this is not a a silver market and being very narrow. This is a broad based commodity rally. Gold and silver are gonna go with the whims of investors here, but the things I'm talking about are more traditional uh, type of true consumption commodities. Yes, silver is, is more consumable than gold when it comes to its uses. However, things like oil, things like um, you know copper, nickel, aluminum, zinc, uh, things also in the agriculture space, um, the food stuff, is extremely important now too, uh, just because of this uptick in demand. So the way we run our commodity strategy is that we use a hybrid approach of having a basket that we think um, you know the, the long only component can be very, very accretive in a market. In fact, if you look at the signals that are given to you by the shape of the curves in the commodity market, they actually emphasize how much stress is in that in, in the marketplace. And so that's what we call backwardation. Again, I want to give you a lecture on, on the commodity lexicon. But with backwardation, if prices don't move as an investor because you migrate up the price curve, you actually make money on that. So not only is the spot price appreciation accretive today, but also the term structure. And that's something our commodity strategy has always focused on. And then secondly, we have a long short commodity component there. It's systematic in nature. It's built off of quantitative and fundamental signals. And our allocation to that long short portfolio today is zero. It's been zero since the beginning of October. We have timing signals where we think about the marketplace and everything is told us to be long, fully the beta. And that has been the absolute right place to be in the commodities market. And as we reconstitute that, look at the signals right now, it still says the same thing. So commodities are one place that have significant momentum. Uh, you have to make sure you understand what you're buying. And you know, I'm very supportive of buying those broad-based baskets uh, when it comes to that space. You mentioned avoiding things. I think you know investors have been long very very narrow parts of the market and and robert touched on it, strong earnings in the tech sector uh, people's portfolios that didn't rebalance or been in these things that worked last year have really gotten hit hard uh, we've seen a disruption trade fall apart this year as now it's the disruption to the disruption where you go back to more traditional type of, of parts of the economy so what i think people should be doing is making sure you have broad exposure to things uh, that's why I like the value trade still. I know it's it's been a widow maker trade for a lot of people relative to growth. But if we do have this, let's call it semi-inflationary market with somewhat of a couple with a somewhat of a, a decent growth rate, even say we go long term post GFC trend to 2.3, 2.4% real with a little bit of inflation, five to five and a half percent nominal growth. Um, it's very accretive for a value type of strategy because you no longer have that scarcity of growth again. So looking at fundamentals, this is something I'm going to talk about tomorrow um, in my in my equity panel is I'm going to talk about what these metrics are telling you. So um, really the avoiding, I think, is some of the high flyers, things that have been working and making sure that you're looking at international exposure, you're looking at emerging market equities and you're trying to build out those things, which really had been out of favor for many years and really have a supportive backdrop, especially with our outlook on the dollar and long-term secular bear market. 
I think both of you all are doing a great job um, in terms of, you know, explaining uh, this. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to kind of turn back and kind of talk about uh, this environment and, you know, maybe what some of the, the expectations are, maybe, you know, maybe some of the fears. Um, you know, assuming inflation is persistent, uh, will the Fed move to raise rates or taper to avoid a late 1970s to 1980s style inflationary environment? Something that I keep hearing coming up. Um, you know, I, I could say this, like my parents have talked about uh, the 1970s, for example. So we'd love to kind of hear from both of you, your views there. Robert, let me jump on that one. I'll let you pick it up. But you know, when I, I think about the Fed, they've done everything they can to emphasize forward guidance and they're going to get ridicule. Uh, there's so much talk in the last couple of weeks about why does the Fed still buy agency mortgages? The housing market's so strong and people forget buying agency mortgages isn't really necessarily supporting the housing market. It's just their way of, of trying to influence interest rates and suppress interest rates. So. Um, you know, th there's this dynamic that the Fed's going to taper. There's a lot of expectations and tapering. What tapering means is that they're going to reduce their quantitative easing purchases. And for those of you that aren't aware, the Fed is committed to buy at least $120 billion worth of securities a month, at least. So there's nothing in that language that, that connotes taper or reduction. And Chairman Powell himself at his last pe press conference was extremely emphatic that they're not even thinking about thinking about taper. That's how he talked about raising interest rates. But he said, it's not even, we're not even thinking about discussing it yet, I think is what he did. He's leaving it open to be able to not think about thinking about it again. So uh, I don't think that the Fed's gonna try to surprise people. I think the Chairman Powell, and he's the one you need to listen to. It's not Richard Clarida. It's not anyone else there. The chairman is the one who is communicating the policy. There's diverse opinions from regional governors because they represent their regions. Chairman Powell is the one you listen to. And he's been very emphatic about, emphatic about this because Julie, you're talking about a 70s or 80s style of inflation and where Paul Volcker was very aggressive in hiking rates. But remember, it's, it's this recency bias that the Fed has. They remember Ben Bernanke and his taper tantrum. So the Fed has done such a, a good job, and I'll say it's a good job of managing expectations. They believe in the Draghi, whatever it takes, forward guidance approach. That's essentially what they've done. By them saying they're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, what that does, that suppresses the front end of the yield curve. Because if you don't think rates are raise, rising for the next one to two years, you keep the front end of the curve pinned down. And if you look at the front end of the curve, it remains there. So the bond market isn't really thinking about thinking about raising rates. Now you can talk about taper. Well, the whole thing about taper is where do they believe that the Fed needs to reduce purchases before they'll start hiking rates? And the reason for that is, well, it's kind of contradictory. We're going to keep buying bonds, but, you know, we need to hike rates. So you don't need to be doing those things in conflict with yourself. So I still think that the if you look at the bond market pricing, after today's move a little bit, you're seeing the first hike kind of saying, okay, it's early 2023. Um, it's been as early as December 22. Uh, back in February, it migrated out to April of 23. Now we're back in February again. Well, what that is, that's an average of expectations. So when you think about those hikes, it's maybe that we're going to be zero for the next few years. And there's people who think, oh, we're going to have to hike three or four times. That's how you get on average those numbers. So I just don't think it's in the cards. Uh, if you think about where the Fed dictates policy and really communicates policy changes, it's been historically, at least for the last decade or so, the Jackson Hole Symposium. So I don't think taper is discussed at the, it, it may be discussed, but it'll be dismissed by Chairman Powell at the June meeting and it'll be punted till later on in the year. Again, they're gonna stick to the transitory mandate. They've worked very hard to communicate this. So although all of us are seeing these signs of inflation, we're seeing these things of the reflation concept, the growth concept, uh, the Fed is kind of whistling through the graveyard at this point, And I don't expect them to 180, uh, to make a 180 degree turn because they need to manage the expectations of the market because that's the way they've set it up. Robert, do you want to build yeah. on that? Yeah, well, let me jump in. So uh, if we don't expect to taper, then you're continuing to inject liquidity into the market. Uh, we've talked about supply disruptions and we have wage pressures. There are long-term demographic issues with birth rates going down. 
And so we have this setup that could generate uh, the stagflation you were talking about in 1970 style, where you have, uh, you know, it takes time to increase uh, capacity. So if you are a, a company that has been curtailing capacity because of the pandemic, you can't just look at a switch and turn it back on again. We've seen that, you know, maybe in the uh, uh, auto industry, for example, you have semiconductor shortages. Maybe that's transitory. But if you think through other, you know, broadly across the economy, building capacity takes time. Uh, and so as as uh, companies try to do this, they try to add capacity, you're going to have supply shortages. There has been wage pressure. Uh, there has to be uh, coincident growth with that. Otherwise, you can't absorb that, uh, you know, those levels of cost increases. So. It seems to me it's certainly possible that we enter into this sort of stagflation environment where the uh, economy just can't ramp up fast enough to handle uh, sort of demand that's been induced by uh, monetary spending and fiscal spending. And so through that, you need a level of growth. Uh, I think a lot of investors talk about this Goldilocks scenario where uh, the, the, the monetary side of things, uh, you know, keeps liquidity going and then we're going to have this fiscal, you know, bill after fiscal bill, we're going to inject, you know, trillion dollar bills one after another. And through that, you're going to get pe money in people's pockets and they're going to go out and spend and, and we're going to have growth. Uh, well, I guess if that's the case, then we should be even having more and more trillion dollar uh, uh, bills coming out of, out of Congress. But I think more likely that uh, the efficacy of these uh, of bills coming out of Congress is going to, is going to decrease over time. In which case we have all the costs built up from all this liquidity, but not the growth. And so that does sort of lead back to, you know, your uh, example of going back to for 1970s, Jimmy Carter style uh, types of uh, stagflation. I think that there is a risk of that. And so uh, I think you have to uh, think of that as, a, as a, putting a portfolio together, managing through that. I mean, it's certainly it's not a certainty that it happens, but. You know, it's a heightened probability. And so you have to be uh, have your portfolio constructed in a way to, to handle that. So commodities, hard assets do that. Uh, companies that can grow earnings in that environment, they have to be uh, growers. Um, you know, Jeffrey was uh, speaking about how uh, the tech, uh, parts of the stock market are overvalued. And so you have to worry about that. That's, I guess, the trick. Uh, uh, tech in particular, those are growers, but they're extremely expensive. And you're starting to see them perform poorly with the expectation of rising rates. So you have to kind of thread the needle and find individual situations where you have uh, growth, uh, uh, but not overpaying for it, and a, a fundamental backdrop that will do well if you have some of these risks start to, uh, uh, you know, come to fruition. I guess you know to that that point, um, you're just mentioning um, a couple of the areas that could do well in that environment. Could we um, explore that further about for both of you? Like, what sectors of the economy do you expect to do well in an inflationary environment? And maybe some of the ones that aren't as obvious. Uh, yeah. Well, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, I suppose what's obvious. We mentioned tech. We mentioned healthcare, uh, housing, which I think Jeff might have mentioned, in, or mentioned in other sec segments. Uh, during the day today, uh, the housing market is very strong. And so that has a ripple through to many other sort of, sort of kind of tangential segments, building products, chemicals, materials. And so I don't know that people are necessarily focused on that, they focus on the housing market, but that's an area that uh, certainly I would expect to do well. Uh, I mentioned uh, groceries, which is something you probably wouldn't talk a lot about, but groceries were, uh, grocers were a segment of the economy that was actually doing kind of poorly pre-COVID uh, because the Amazons and Walmarts and Costco's coming in and creating a lot of pressure. And so those companies were having uh, suffering from competitive threats. And then the pandemic came and everyone's out of toilet paper. And the next thing you know, uh, their margins exploded. Uh, uh, I think that's a segment that, again, people, it isn't top of mind, but they could drift back down to their uh, pre-pandemic uh, type of uh, existence where they're back having all the competitive threats of Amazon and Costco and so on. Uh, but at the same time, they're also seeing inflationary pressures. And these uh, stores don't do well when they're having inflationary pressures. So I think that's an area to sort of steer clear of. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are other segments. Uh, you know, autos right now are in, in an undersupplied environment because of uh, capacity issues with semiconductors. But 
I think once those uh, uh, kind of uh, shorter term issues get worked through, uh, the auto industry is brutally competitive and we have this transition to potentially electron electric cars. And so that's an area, not just the autos, so not just focusing on the big manufacturers, but it, it translates through to the supply chain. So what does that mean for uh, gasoline engine manufacturers and uh, uh, yeah, you know, component parts for that? Uh, that's something you have to think about. Uh, we've been having a lot of debate about gas stations, believe it or not. So there are gas station credits in, in, in the corporate credit market. Uh, they're not going away immediately, but they could be going away uh, faster than we think. So if you have real inflationary pressure where the price of gasoline goes up a lot, that could pull forward a lot of the demand for electric cars. Well, then what does that mean for gas stations that already have thin margins? Uh, so we think about that. You have to think about uh, areas of uh, uh, media and telecom that are going through these sort of secular changes. Uh, people don't watch broadcast TV anymore. And so what does that mean for broadcasters? Uh, they've had uh, historically very large multiples. Maybe those multiples start to contract now because we're in an environment where people are going online and going, going to, you know, to uh, Netflix and Disney and so on. So those multiples come down and uh, that's an area of concern. Uh, obviously people aren't using their uh, uh, wireline telephones anymore. They're going to wireless. These are transitions you have to be careful of. So we're not just talking about issues related to inflation talking about issues related to a changing economic landscape, uh, changing kind of consumer patterns and technological change. So these are all areas you have to think about. Um, so, you know, I'd highlight these sort of sunset industries, the media industry, radio. Uh, you can even look at um, uh, billboard industries. So there are, there are companies in the billboard industry that have generated huge profits. Well, maybe if the kind of idea of working in offices and, uh, Maybe that, not that it's going to go away, but if it goes down in value, if people aren't traveling around as much, uh, then maybe these are businesses that sort of drift in value. And so I think it's important to think about like what are the economies, what are the sectors of the future, and uh, are you positioned right for that? Whether or not there's inflation or not, I think these are uh, broad forces that are going to play out over many, many years you have to pay attention to. I like how Robert positioned that too, because instead of saying, you know, here are the things that, that are really benefit from it, he's highlighting the negatives. And that's where active management comes in as well, right? You have the ability to navigate various parts of the market, but you can also circumvent those things with, which just have extremely negative outlooks. And so let's just talk about the US equity market then. Um, obviously the CAPE ratio is extremely high. We've only seen it this high one other time in history. And it pushed higher uh, before it ultimately melted down. But if you dig beneath the surface, and, and this is really the, the reason for thinking about still owning equities, still owning U.S. equities, is if you strip off the top 10 market capitalization names, the CAPE ratio diminishes massively. In fact, it goes to barely overvalued, or at least in the context of history, and so and versus grossly overvalued. I'd say it's more like average-ish type of behavior. So just thinking about that. What can you do? You can fade the winners, right? You can go buy the equally weighted portfolio. You can go buy sectors that don't have as much exposure there, which we do in some of our strategies. So the idea here is to remember to focus on valuation. Don't get caught up in the narrative. Don't move the entire portfolio to try to benefit from inflation, right? The idea here, have a view, tilt towards it, but make sure that you're also thinking about how the future looks. So. You don't need to have a portfolio that's 80% allocated to space assets uh, because space is the future and people are going to buy rocket ships or trips on rocket ships to Mars with Dogecoin, right? This is, this is, these are narratives that take off that essentially people tend to lose a lot of money in. And so again, think about what's happened. We have went through a pandemic. We will not resume life as we knew it in, in 2019. It will be different. It's going to change. It's not going to be exaggerated where it's going to be like 2020, where we're all locked down. But you have to think about what shifts were underway. COVID was a massive accelerator of things that of trends both directions, technological trends, but also these legacy assets from the economy. So when you think about value investing, and again, essentially how Robert's portraying it is exactly right. Avoid those industries which don't have pricing power. 
own good competitive businesses, ones that are also going to be doing CapEx to get the return on equity going forward. And so these are the things that, again, active management can achieve, but also avoiding things is one of the biggest parts of portfolio management. If you can avoid some of the losing ideas and the losing themes out there, uh, it sets up to be very strong performance over the long run. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said about don't get caught up in, in the narratives here. Um, yeah. I, one, one of the topics um, that I am curious about um, has been, you know, wages. Um, and can we see sustained inflationary pressure um, without sustained wage growth? That's that's something that I've always believed in that, you know, again, outside of money printing, um, you know, the, the old quote from Milton Freeman is that um, uh, inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. I think it's always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. But a lot of that comes from wages. So there's another way you can get inflation that people don't think they intend to think about. And that's through borrowing right through credit. You borrow money consume today that actually has short term inflationary impacts, but it it becomes more disinflationary over a longer period. Um, but when you really think about the dynamics of the wage problem, I think it's it's too early to tell if we have it. The average hourly earnings, which come out monthly uh, from the BLS, uh, from the jobs report that we get on the first Friday of every month, or it's usually the first Friday. Um, what you've seen there is a distortion of the dynamics, what we call the composition effect. So we knew in the pandemic, low wage jobs were hit har the hardest. So you saw a recession come on and average hourly earnings spike. Well, there's ways to control for that. You can go to other data series, such as the Atlanta Fed, which compares the same work curve to a year ago. What we've actually seen there, Julia, over the last few years is that wages have grown between three to 4%. That's per annum, that, that's been the path. But if you look at some of these labor shortages and some people will anecdotally say, well, it's because of stimulus, we've seen a certain economy, a certain states uh, reduce the pandemic insurance. We've seen some states like California, uh, potentially it's because uh, Governor Newsom's on the hook now, uh, he's gonna be go up for recall. We've seen some people increase them. I think what you're what you're seeing here in the dynamics is you need to figure out, you know, what is driving that lack of, of motivation within the labor market. And there's it's not just the idea that there's benefits and stimulus coming through, it's also the school system isn't open everywhere. So there's daycare issues. If you look at this, the if you look at the demographics of female uh, unemployment and return to labor force, it's been somewhat diminished. Maybe that changes over the next cycle. Also, maybe some people also said, you know what? I'm sick of working that, that minimum wage job at a restaurant. I wanna go back to school and I wanna redefine myself or I wanna go learn a trade instead. I'm tired of getting yelled at, getting exposure to all these diseases, not just COVID, hepatitis C, whatever it may be that you see uh, inside of a, of a restaurant. And they're saying, I just don't wanna do that anymore. And so I think that's what we need to really see for a while to see if there is true wage pressure. Now, we've known that there's wage pressure in technology. We see it at double line, right? When we need to hire employees, we have to be competitive uh, from the technological sector. So the wage pressure has always been there in certain pockets of the market. It hasn't been as broad based. So do we need a $15 minimum wage across the country? That's up for debate. Uh, here in California, it's already 14. So you tell me 14 versus 15 doesn't matter. In Mississippi, that's a whole different dynamic. And we saw the same outsized effects when we sent pandemic uh, stimulus checks, pandemic insurance to people, where it was a steady rate or a nominal dollar amount, but it wasn't adjusted for cost of living. So the $600 a week we were seeing didn't go as far in California as again, I use my example of Mississippi again. So when we look at wage pressure, we'll have to see if it is this mismatch of labor and the skill set that's in the marketplace to put pressure on wages. On wages, but um, again, I do think that if we're going to introduce UBI, which I think we've started to do, the universal basic income, um, that people get hooked on it. People say, "Okay, well, look, you have to compete with that," and that is a true fear over time. But so far, if I look at the JOLTS data, which is job openings, uh, it's a, it's the Fed's favorite measure of looking for the jobs out there. You saw an increase in those as well. So I think it's too early to tell. If this is really just, you know, this uh, kind of narrow view that's because of all the all the benefits we've given people or if it's truly a mismatch of labor and skill set. So if that's the case, there's going to be the haves and have nots there. And you'll see that dichotomy come through in wage growth. But I do expect to see wages uptick. There's the dynamic. There's people talking about the government is starting to pay better. You see this in Biden's announcements. 
Um, so there is the wage pressure there. And remember, the federal minimum wage hasn't changed in over a decade. I mean, it, it probably is time to move it from seven and a quarter to 15 is a massive, massive increase. But I could see that that being underway uh, of moving that trajectory. Remember here in California, we, we transitioned to target a $15 minimum wage by next year. And we did it over the course of five years. So it's not overnight. But again, it's this, it's it's the skill set and the demand for those wages. And if you need workers, you have to pay them what the market rate is. Yeah, Robert, anything I, you I, want to add? Yeah, I'd add to that. You know, I think inflation, we're talking about broadly inflation and wages inflation uh, as well, is going to be very sector specific, as we've been mentioning. So clearly there's going to be, if inflation comes, uh, there's a shortage of tech workers. We know that. There is not a shortage of energy workers. And so there have been a lot of people working in the energy patch and oil and gas production uh, that may, maybe not have uh, as much employment uh, options as they had before. And in that area, there's going to be potentially wage deflation. So it's going to be very sector, sector specific, in my, in my opinion. So you're going to see particular areas of the economy as they grow uh, uh, be in potentially a, a supply shortage condition where there are, you know, it's just an insufficient supply of workers. Um, you know, we talk about sort of these temporary things with uh, uh, opening back restaurants, uh, not enough uh, rental cars, things like that. Those will pass, but there is a skills mismatch that I think is going to be persistent. Uh, so uh, as as we start to, uh, uh, you know, continue to see growth in particular parts of the economy, healthcare being another one, there's a shortage of doctors. Uh, there's going to be price pressure. And so I think, you know, wrapping this all up, I think the inflation is going to be uneven. There's going to be sectors of the economy that are going to see uh, the deflation, uh, like I mentioned, you know, like uh, wireless telephone or whatever, wireline telephone, things like that, that, that just are, you know, uh, don't have the pricing power and we'll see uh, uh, potentially uh, earnings falling and, and wages falling. But then there's going to be areas of growth that are going to see uh, inflationary pressures. So it's not all one thing. It's really very uh, sector specific when you're talking about industries and very skill specific when you're talking about wages. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions um, for, for the, the panel here. Um, curious, uh, are commodities a better hedge or for, are commodities a better hedge for inflation or would you prefer low duration credit? Well, uh, low duration credit is a nice carry trade um, in today's environment. You know, you're talking a, a low two percent uh, type of yield if uh, you, you do it right um, and you try to balance things out. You can do a little bit better, as uh, Robert said, if you go to uh, a narrow part of the market. Uh, you look at just like specific like CLOs and certain parts of the capital structure. Um, but definitely, the commodity market it's going to have volatility, so they're completely different on the volatility profile. If you look at our low duration strategy, and even including the illiquidity of last year, which kind of amplified volatility, you're talking about a long-term volatility tar uh, range that's about 200 basis points. Uh, commodities can have 200 basis points of volatility in an hour, right? Uh, they're not up to their crypto where they can have that in a second, uh, but they are volatile. And so this is the idea of building it. But if you think about what does well in an inflationary and some semblance of growth. And that's exactly where we are this year. I mean, it, uh, I, I almost kind of laughed one of the strategists out of the room when, when they did a virtual call with our, our key portfolio managers. And they said, we expect nominal GDP to be north of 10% this year. And I said, whoa, wait a second. This is early in 2021. And I said, whoa, wait a second. Where does that come from? Five nominal, five, you know, in inflation? No, it's a seven real and three inflation. And I was like, wow, seven? And that looks right on, that looks spot on at this point. So another thing to think about is, can you get commensurate growth along with it? If you look in se sectors of the equity market, historically industrials tend to be the most correlated to the economic cycle. And you're seeing that right now. You're seeing this outperformance in the industrial sector. So uh, again, industrial sector, pricing power, they pass through commodities. So um, if I were looking pure commodity and, and the reflation concept, there's a reason we tell this reflation and inflation because I think you're seeing both today. And from that construct, I still like the commodity space. Now, 
What that means is you have to size it accordingly. You don't want to put 100% of your portfolio uh, into a commodity basket. But if you don't own any today, this is one of the most underloved, underappreciated, underinvested asset classes. And, and, and again, that's part of the CapEx story. And so ultimately, if, I, if you got to pen me down in the next 12 months, uh, although you're probably going to have somewhere between seven to 10 times the volatility, I would take the commodity trade over the low duration trade today. As a bond investor, obviously, I'll take the low duration trade all day long. Yeah, you know, what, what I would add to that is I think you have to think about, uh, first of all, not being all in one bet, with, with Jeff mentioned. We don't all just be in the space paid by Dogecoin trade or all in commodities. You have to have a diversified portfolio. Uh, commodities make a lot of sense, but you also want to have something to uh, trade volatility. So if you're talking about true low duration, uh, like some of the strategies run here, they they uh, will not get as beaten up if you have volatility. So maybe you own some commodities and you own some low duration. And if other sectors of fixed income market or the equity market get beaten up, well, there's a great rotation trade out of something that uh, maybe might be flat or down a little bit into something that has gotten really beaten up. I think that's the kind of trade. You know, whether there's inflation or not, it's not going to be in a straight line. I expect that there we're going to have uh, inflation, but, you know, there's going to be moments where people say, uh, like recently up until today, uh, it's kind of worked its way. We've had the big rate move. There isn't going to be anything more. And then all of a sudden the narrative changes and everyone's back to thinking there's going to be inflation. So as these narratives kind of uh, uh, ebb and flow, there's going to be volatility, I would expect, in most markets. And having something as kind of dry powder to rotate is, I think, pretty important. And then when those things run up, you know, whatever you bought, if you bought some equities or you bought some high yield because of volatility and they run up again, then maybe it's time to rotate back into your kind of placeholder of low duration, waiting for the next sort of trade to happen. That's how I would think about it. Got it. Well, final question for you both. Um, when we think about double line and the name of double line, you know, don't cross the double line of risk um, in the spaces that you both, um, you know, operate in. What right now would be that double line of risk that you do not want to cross? Um, and in my viewpoint right now, it's duration. Um, I think that it's been something that's been a tailwind. Um, you, you've, you've heard from some of our colleagues talking about well, you know, there could be the deflationary aspects, but right now that, that should not be in the narrative, I don't think at all. You can think about it over the next 12 to 18 months, um, but don't rely on the Fed to bail you out. Don't rely on, on the, the greater fool theory of the next investor to buy you out at a higher price. And remember that duration cuts both ways. It was your friend last year, rates have been rising. Uh, it's undeniable at this point. We've been in a rising rate environment. It doesn't matter if rates go up 10 basis points or 20 basis points. They can wipe out a significant part of the overall yield of your portfolio. So, um, and I know we use a, a ratio around here at times where we look at the yield to duration. But when I look at setups like that, where you, you kind of lose if rates go up, you clip coupon if it goes sideways, and if it goes down in a meaningful manner, spreads blood and you lose again. That's a double line of risk to me. So I, I like Robert's idea. If you want to own credit, own it on the shorter duration, take some risk with it. Maybe pair it with a little bit of a rage trade in the pure treasury market, and then also just augment those things um, to what your portfolio needs to behave in terms of duration. So if I can build a portfolio today, and I look at our strategies, I can build a low duration strategy that yields about 2%, has very little interest rate risk, has a duration around one year, that gives me a lot of volatility to absorb interest rates. And if it's in a meaningful manner, that rate rise, you can reinvest. So the thing I think that is the riskiest is extrapolating anything, getting caught up in narratives, getting caught up in what just recently worked. There's a theme every year, Julia. Every year you can go back and say, okay, what's the hot thing, right? Was it pot stocks? You know, was it cryptocurrencies? Was it real estate? There's always the narrative. And by the time it catches on with most people, the price movement is over. So try to identify those trends, make sure that you're not overexposed to risk. At the end of it, you have a chance, you don't have to make money every day. And some of the important things here is not losing money. And so I like avoiding trades here. Uh, I, I'm pretty bullish on the overall global economy at this stage. I know we have challenges, but the fiscal authorities are dumping money left and right. And you have a very supportive um, uh, monetary backdrop as well. 
Yeah, I think how, how I would answer that is I think there's a huge momentum trade in the reopening names in credit, in corporate credit. So as people caught on that a vaccine was coming and that we would start to reopen the economy, there were huge bets placed on energy, automotive, uh, uh, airlines, hotels, and so on. And that has largely worked. If you look at some of the, if you look at the returns year to date, uh, these reopening trades have been really the big winners. Uh, but many of them, uh, uh, you know, have balance sheets that are sort of unsustainable. There are safer areas. I think, you know, gaming example will come through fine. I think Vegas will survive. But the airlines have real balance sheet problems that need to be worked through. And so, yeah, it was a great trade. We buying uh, airline stocks was the hot Reddit trade of, you know, 2020, among others. Uh, they're going to have balance sheet issues. Uh, so there's, I think that's, in, in, in credit, I think that's where the risks lie in these hot momentum names that were opening trades that really are, uh, you know, have balance sheet issues and really have kind of uh, business plan uh, issues that have to get worked through. I mean, we, I like saying when we invest in credit, we're lending money to people we actually think will pay us back. And some of these, I think it's questionable whether they're going to pay us back. And I think that's where the double line of risk sits in in these uh, sort of like hot uh, momentum recovery uh, uh, reopening trades that now have to actually generate cash flow and, and service debt and uh, get their balance sheet in order. Um, well, actually, if you all don't mind. <clears throat> We don't mind, Julia, but we lost you on the video. Yeah. <laughs> right. So with that, I'm going to take over. I'm going to do my best Julia LaRoche impersonation and say thanks to everybody for joining us. We really appreciate you spending the day with us here at Double Line. Please tune in tomorrow. We have a lot of new topics to discuss. Uh, we have a big, strong lineup. We're kicking off the day. Uh, I'll be hosting a conversation with Jeffrey Gunlock and, and Felix Zuloff. So stay tuned for two titans in the industry. Uh, we've got some more uh, discussion about ways to think about uh, your portfolios, whether that's infrastructure, assets, uh, things such as the equity market as well. And we're going to go through some really interesting ideas on how to trade the equity market going forward. So um, that's my best Julia LaRoche impersonation. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> okay, I'm and back. now I'll give it to the real deal. So you're back, Julia. Uh, you did a very convincing job, Jeff. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. Oh, I, I think I think we uh, lost. Uh, we're again, just going to so wrap it up, Julia. So, yeah, thanks everybody. Good. We're going to end this thanks, session. Guys. So thanks again. Thanks for tuning. Thanks, Julia, for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow for some more interviews. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks both.